אוקיי, שם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We are uh, back to a uh, shiurim, a little bit of different, different setting. Uh, we, um, uh, Baruch Hashem, our arrangement with the synagogue was completed and uh, they were uh, going in a different direction. So right now we don't have a location for, uh, for Bezat Hashem, for the live lectures uh, with the audience. So uh, for now, so at least we can get something going. We are just doing this shoe out of my house. Um, let me see the list, one second. Tonight's shoe will be for a refuah uh, shlema for Rabbanit Levana Bat Sara, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat, David Ben Esriya, Doris Bat Jora, Esther Bat Zipora, Doris uh, uh, Dvor Bat Mercedes, um, Michal Bat Yael, Batya Bat uh, Sara, טליה בת שרה, יתרו בן אברהם, אורית בת אילנה, and uh, also uh, הצלחה רבה for uh, דוד בן uh, נתנאל, um, שאול בן פרזנה, אושרי בן דוריס, גבי בן דוריס, אלעד בן דוריס, דוד בן עשריה, מרשה בת ג'ולי, And uh, also Ayla, uh, uh, but uh, Marsha. And also Joshua ben David. Zad uh, Hashem HaKadosh Baruch Hu will uh, bring each and every one of them success and good blessings with Zad Hashem. Especially those that help us do all the good things that we're trying to do. So uh, a little bit of an update. It's, um, you know, obviously Baruch Hashem, another test from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Yishtabach Shemo. We, uh, you know, for the last uh, six, six, seven years, we've been giving lectures in front of a crowd. They generally uh, don't give uh, lectures in, uh, by myself for, for a bunch of reasons. I've done it uh, a few times, but I uh, don't really like to. Um, one of the reasons is because you have a, uh, the benefit of having special siyat dishmaya due to the crowd. You know, so when you have a uh, different type of audience and you're trying to help people and um, those people come to the lecture, uh, Hashem literally gives you words to say for their benefit. So it's not even yours, it's simply for their benefit. So many times, uh, you know, you end up helping a lot of people um, that are not just there, but also people around the world because of the, uh, the people that have, you know, taken on the initiative and actually got out of their uh, big fancy couch and comfortable couch and actually went to the shield. So it's a lot easier to, to speak in front of a crowd. I mean, I've been speaking for over 20 years, uh, you know, from the business world. Uh, so it's not necessarily a matter of uh, difficulty. It's just that uh, there's, uh, you know, more blessing in it. It's more fun to deal with uh, when you see actual people instead of seeing a camera. But, Baruch Hashem, it is what it is. You know, it's a... Um, something that uh, we knew was a possibility simply because anytime you uh, don't have your own place or even if you do but uh, especially if you don't have your own place you're always uh, you know vulnerable to sudden change you know and uh, over the last six seven years that we've been doing shulim it's uh, we've changed location of you know quite a few times uh, you know, I think when we first started, we started, we, we used to do shiurim just at my house, then uh, we started doing it at some other Bet Knesset, and uh, then we changed the Bet Knesset to another one, uh, and uh, after we finished that series, we went to a different Bet Knesset, so Baruch Hashem, we've done uh, a few different places for the uh, uh, shiurim. Uh, but usually the, uh, the change from one place to another was uh, a lot more sudden than it should be, you know, because if you were at a place for a year, two years, you would think that uh, you'd have, you know, a few months notice before you leave, but life doesn't really work that way, you know, it's uh, in all parts of life, you know, everybody wants to have uh, things, uh, you know, in order, and planned out, or, you know, planned uh, retirement and planned marriage and planned everything else, planned your kids. But, uh, you know, it's 
the Chazal teaches us Rabot Machshavot Belevish Ve'etzat Hashem Yitakum. There's a lot of ideas, a lot of plans in a person's uh, mind, but only the ideas of Hashem are the ones that are going to be ex executed. Uh, so, uh, you know, you plan. So anyway, if I, uh, just a small update of what's going on with um, location. You know, a few months ago we moved uh, to Cooper City, Florida, and uh, we announced that we're planning on building a community here. You know, we want to build a Bet uh, Knesset, a synagogue, a yeshiva, a place for the shulim, a kolel, a school. You know, so a lot of different things we want to build. Obviously, all of it is going to take some time, but uh, sooner rather than later. But the first thing really we, uh, you know, we tried to do when we first got here is to get to a uh, place that's uh, going to be um, really fit everything that we want, or at least a, a large part of it. But what I'm finding out is that the Yetzirah is, as hard as we work, the Yetzirah is working even harder, you know, and there's a lot of uh, strange rules, uh, you know, it, it's, I don't know if it's necessarily just Cooper City, I think it's just uh, different... Uh, counties each one has their own uh, their own strange rules but um either way it seems like uh they're not very uh keen on having uh synagogues as part of their uh you know tenants because the first first building that we found which seemed like a perfect fit uh after wasting some time with them it ended up not working out because they simply told us we don't want a synagogue you know, uh, we don't want it, you know, and then, you know, the, uh, the broker told me uh, on the other side, not my broker, my broker is a good guy, uh, but the broker on the other side said, oh, well, maybe you could just do this and do something else. I told him, no, you know, we say what we do, and if you accept us, good, if not, uh, we move on, whatever, it is what it is, you know, and that's, that's one of the things that I, I tried to work very hard on my whole life, uh, even more so now, and I try to teach all of the people that listen to me, students, uh, you know, colleagues, and so on, is that you have to be very, very precise when it comes to your words. And I think that that's one of the um, one of the main things that if people simply, you know, stood up for what they spoke about and and, and really had a word, if they, you know, in, in, in the old old days we'd call it if you had a spine. I think life would be very, very different in the world, you know, because today there's just a lot of people that are just simply spineless, where they say one thing and they do something else, and uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit before you guys uh, hopefully have some questions for me, but, um, you know, I, I try very hard to, if I say something, I do it, and, and, and the same thing goes when it comes to the Torah, where if it's the Torah says something, we say it without any consideration whatsoever of whether it's going to be popular, not popular, none of that stuff really matters. What matters is what's the emit, what's the bottom line, and that's what we're going to say. And I think that if people simply live their life that way, uh, life would be much better for them, for everybody around them. Uh, but anyway, that was how, you know, the first place said no, second place wasn't exactly a good fit. And... Um, for the last couple of months, we've been trying to figure out what we're going to do. And then, you know, after uh, last week when we, uh, or two weeks ago, when we found out that um, our arrangement with the synagogue is over uh, and we have to find another place, we immediately started looking for different places. Uh, but uh, it's proven to be a lot more difficult than I thought because a lot of places, not just the first place, a lot of places don't want... Uh, what they call an assembly type of uh, business, meaning where a lot of people gather, and it's not just because of Corona. It's definitely Corona has an in, you know has a uh, has something to do with it as far as you know naturally, uh, but also the way that the real estate rules are is that it's it's which is something that we just learned now is that uh, the building the way it's built um, and and all of the paperwork that goes along with it. Uh, has to have that ability. You can't just build a building, you know, uh, and just assume you can just have any tenant you want. It doesn't work that way. So anyways, it was a big, uh, you know, big chidush, uh, to say the least, um, because we spent a lot of time uh, looking at, uh, you know, this one place uh, yesterday, the day before, 
and had a great idea of how things would work, only to find out after all the time was spent, and you know, simply that it was a waste of time. Why a waste of time? Because the builders uh, built the complex uh, in such a way that uh, they left themselves no ability uh, to have an assembly type business, meaning that they have a rule that you have to have a certain amount of parking for every hundred square feet of space that you have. Uh, so you have to have one parking lot for every hundred square feet. Uh, and uh, if it's an assembly type business, meaning if it's like a, uh, you know, a synagogue, a church, a restaurant, a library, you know, anything uh, that's, uh, people are gonna stay in that store for more than just a few minutes to buy a shoe or something. So anyway, so uh, these uh, builders um, built a place where they preferred to have, um, you know, less parking, more building. And um, it seems like uh, they shot themselves or at least their tenants in the, in the foot because now um, if you're not a, uh, you know, I don't know, shoe store or something or you're not selling, uh, uh, if you're not a deli, you simply can't get space in this uh, in this uh, entire shopping center, uh, which now makes sense why the whole place is empty after so many months uh, of being completed. Anyway, so that's that. I mean, uh, of course, people are constantly giving me ideas of, of, of what they think we should do, and I, I appreciate the ideas. I would be much more appreciative if the ideas came with, you know, uh, a few million dollars too, uh, so we can do the ideas we already have. Uh, but uh, the main thing is is that we are trying to um, you know raise some money so we can actually build what we want uh, that's really what it comes down to in order for us to get what we want we have to build it now that's not going to help us short term though that's not going to help us short term because short term uh, you need to have something to do the lectures to have people you know to build something is going to take a while it's going to take two three years to build uh, these things even if let's say for example you bought a building that's already made just to rehash it and fix it and do whatever you need to do between the paperwork and everything else it's going to take you uh probably close to a year uh you know to get get it up to speed so the point is that we need to raise the money for that big project uh asap so we could actually start it but we also have to have a different solution uh shorter term and um you know, some people ask me, why don't you just do uh, the shiur at uh, somebody's house? Uh, because I used to do it uh, a few times a week, uh, you know, at, at, at people's houses, the shiurim. And uh, I thought about it. I thought about uh, doing the shiur at somebody's house, but um, I'm sorry to say that I can't do it anymore. Uh, I can't do I spoke to my rabbi about it. And uh, as a result of how things have been over the last few years, uh, there's a few things that go into it. We decided it's not a good idea for us to do it at anybody's house. Um, that's why even when I had people come to my house for Sukkot, I didn't advertise my address. Why? Number one, there are simply too many crazy people. Uh, there are too many crazy people in the world. And unfortunately, sometimes they do show up at our events, uh, either waiting outside or they come in and walk around like weird people or whatever. There's just too many crazy people out there. Now, if we're at a public place, a synagogue, things like that, then, you know, it's not a big deal. But uh, once you are at somebody's house and you advertise that person's house on the Internet, um, you're putting that person in danger. Uh, you're putting that person in danger, and it's just simply not worth it. It's not worth it to put a person in danger that some sociopath uh, is going to show up uh, either because he likes me too much or he can't stand me or somewhere in between. Uh, the point is that that's just too much of a risk to take with people's lives. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing, logistically, it's also a little bit more difficult to have shoe in at people's houses now because the amount of people that come, you know, it's, there's not enough parking in most people's houses, uh, normally speaking. That's really a secondary thing. Really the biggest thing that uh, I really hate to discuss is the fact that there's a reality we have to deal with, which is that there are a lot of crazy people in the world. Uh, there's a lot of crazy people in the world and I don't want those crazy people showing up at anybody's house. Uh, I don't mind uh, you know, dealing with certain people myself. I deal with a lot of interesting people, and unfortunately. 
Uh, some of them are not all there. But um, to put somebody else's life at risk is not, uh, it's not something I'm willing to do. So you know, how, you know, doing the shoeing at somebody's house is not really uh, not going to work. Which means that we have to pray. We have to pray that Hashem finds us a, uh, creates us a place that we could actually have the shulim because, um, you know, in order for us to get back to, to the swing of things the way we did it, uh, we have to have a place. But for now, we're going to try to do this online thing. I don't know if I'm going to be uh, doing the three shulim a week this way. Um, but, uh, you know, well, obviously we'll try to do uh, something. We'll try to do something and at least... Uh, uh, have some to continuous Torah published uh, each week. Um, but this brings me to uh, just give you guys a little bit of Dvar Torah. Hopefully you guys have a, uh, some questions uh, that uh, you're going to write me. Anyone that wants to ask questions. I know the online uh, audience always ask, oh, can we ask questions? Can we ask questions? So today is your day. Because today there is no crowd here. It's just me and you and Abhi Sekhar who is always with us. So today is your day to ask questions. You could already start typing the questions. But Zodosh Hashem, after I finish something very short, uh, you know, we're going to start with the questions. Um, now, this week's parasha, parasha Toldot. Pasha Toldot says, Ve'el Toldot, Yitzchak ben Avram, Avram olid et Yitzchak. These are the offspring of Yitzchak, son of Avram. Avram begat Yitzchak. So Chachamim say, how come you have a superfluous word here? You have Avram mentioned twice, but even more so, why is this unusual language where it says that Avram olid et Yitzchak, which literally translates to Avram gave birth to Yitzchak? Now, anyone that read the parasha this week and sees the Rashi there sees that this was actually a verse specifically to deal with clowns, people that are scorners, people that like to make fun of the Torah. Why? It says that uh, when Avimelech when Avimelech took Sarai Menu and had her at his place overnight, of course, the Kadosh Baruch Hu made sure that uh, he didn't touch her. He, uh, he, um, all of his uh, uh, openings of his body were, were shut. His eyes were shut even. And uh, obviously Hashem was about to kill him before he touched uh, Sarai Menu. But the point is, is that because Sarai Menu was already with Avram for so many years. After she came back uh, from this whole experience, and Avram Avinu came back with this experience, and they saw that uh, shortly after, Sarai is pregnant. Sarai is showing. So the clowns, the clowns that like to say stupid things without actually evaluating what they say before they say it, the clowns that like to, uh, they have something to say about everything, even if it's going to hurt people. You know, similar to clowns, like some clown yesterday, when I said, listen, we're not going to have a shear because we still haven't, uh, we haven't found a place. We haven't raised money for, uh, to buy uh, a new place yet. And, you know, so we're not going to have a shear. So some clown decided that uh, he's going to write, oh, yeah, he just wants more money. Like as if I'm doing this only for money. Uh, but that's it. That's you know, there's clowns in the world. So the clowns in the, are not new. They've always been around. And at the time of Avraham Avinu, the clowns, the scorners, said, "Listen, since Sarai Menu, or they just call her Sarai, since Sarai, she never got pregnant with Avraham for so many years. She only got pregnant after this whole situation happened with Avimelech." So in reality, it's Avimelech that's the father, not Avram. So what did HaKadosh Baruch Hu do? What did HaKadosh Baruch Hu do? In order to deal with all of the scorners, in order to deal with all of the jokesters, HaKadosh Baruch Hu literally changed Yitzchak Avinu's face to be identical to Avram, to the point where it looked like Avram actually gave birth to himself, to, another, you know, to, to, to Yitzchak. Because they looked identical, like identical twins. To, and, and at that time, Hashem did not uh, have people age the way they do today yet. It only started at the time of Avram. 
Uh, I'm sorry, at the time of uh, uh, Yitzchak and Yaakov. So literally, they both look like young men. They looked identical. So first and foremost, everyone would know that there's no way that Yitzchak is coming from Avimelech. Obviously, he came from Avraham. They, they look too identical. Uh, and it's not like he has his, uh, his mother's face or his mother's ears or his mother's eyes. He looks exactly like Avram, as if Avram gave birth to Yitzhak to deal, to, to deal with the scorners. Um, which, again, is to teach us that uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is very much aware of his people, very much aware of the enemies of his people, the enemies of his Torah, and he deals with them accordingly. Uh, but... Um, this is also to teach us that uh, no matter what you do, no matter what you do in life, if you're a good person, uh, you know, already now, or you're trying to be a really good person, there's always going to be somebody that's going to come in your way. And sometimes those people are going to make fun of your way. They're going to make fun of you becoming more religious. They're going to make fun of uh, you trying to serve Hashem. They're going to try to, uh, you know, minimize it. They're going to try to call you extreme. They're going to try to call you fanatic and all types of other words. And the reality is, is that when you look at the, you know, regular secular world, if you will, which is unfortunately the majority of people, you're never going to see people argue with each other by saying, oh, no, you're overly secular. You're, uh, you know, you're fanatic in your liberalism. You're fanatic in your lefty liberalism. You're fanatic in your secular. Nobody cares. The only time people care about so-called fanaticism is if someone is religious, and especially if it's religious Jewish, because you're never really going to see people call Christians fanatics, even though technically they are. You're never really going to see people call the Arabs fanatics unless they murder somebody, which, you know, unfortunately happens a little too often. But nonetheless, if an Arab is just walking around in the street or if they're going into their mosque or something like that, people are not going to point out and say, oh, fanatics, fanatics. Why? Well, first of all, people are scared of them. Uh, but aside from that, uh, aside from the people having scared, people don't care. They don't care about Arab religion or if you see a, a Buddhist walking around you know, uh, it's a, uh, with, his, uh, with his unusual clothes. No one's going to say, oh, he's fanatic a Buddhist. Nobody cares. When is the only time that it's consistent abuse, consistent attack, when people are saying fanatic, when it comes to Jews, when it comes to Orthodox Jews? That's the only time. That's the only time. It's a, uh, you don't, hear about it in the other parts of the world it's nowhere near as much uh, and that's because the Yetzirah doesn't care about uh, interrupting somebody from being an idol worshipper in Christianity or Buddhism or being in the uh, heretical beliefs of, of Islam he doesn't care about those things so he lets them do and it doesn't bother them you want to be a religious uh, you want to be an imam go be an imam you want to be Buddhist go be a Buddhist you want to be a Hindu and uh, Go uh, pray to a cow. Bravo, go ahead, do what you got to do. He's not going to get in the way. He's not going to get in the way. The Yetzirah is not going to have people discourage you from becoming a religious Christian. They're not. He's simply not. Why? Because you're already doing the job for him. But if you're trying to become a religious Orthodox Jew, you're going to see people use the most unusual things in order to cool you off. In the religious world, in the Torah world, this is called Midat Amalek, the trait of Amalek, the trait of Amalek. And one of the biggest reasons of why people uh, do this, why they have this horrible trait of Amalek, of trying to cool people off from being religious, is number one is their own ignorance. They don't know anywhere near as much as they think they know. Uh, but the, it makes them upset that someone else is so confident about their knowledge, about something they don't know anything about, and therefore they uh, use a defense mechanism, a psychological defense mechanism, which is to attack it. The second reason is, aside from their ignorance, is simply their own self-consciousness. They know that you becoming a religious Jew, you living a life with a conscience and a constant, a, um, 
restriction on your behavior makes them uh, uncomfortable. Why? Because they don't restrict any of their own behaviors. A regular person doesn't want to restrict their behaviors. In fact, it's uh, the whole concept of liberalism and the whole concept of, of just today's uh, psyche is to be as open and as free to do what you want as if you're an animal. I mean, people actually uh, admire animals more than they admire uh, you know, good people. And so by you restricting yourself, you're actually making them question themselves. Like, why is he restricting himself? And I can't even get myself to restrict myself to a simple diet, to a simple uh, uh, sleeping schedule. They don't. So by you restricting yourself and being happy about it, being confident about it, being proud of it, uh, it makes people question themselves and they don't like to do it. It makes them feel uh, uncomfortable. Uh, so their own insecurities cause them to lash out. Um, this is, again, another thing that causes people to attack. Uh, another time, another thing that you'll see is that the people that are the most vocal, most vocal Amaleks, most vocal people that are anti-religious, that are around you, are typically going to be people that consider themselves either formerly religious or still semi-religious. You know, they consider themselves religious, but in, a, in, in, in all reality, they're not very religious. They're, they're liberal religious, like the modern orthodox type of religious where, you know, they have a kippah and maybe they'll keep Shabbat, but uh, perhaps uh, not necessarily keep other things that are considered critical in Judaism, such as modesty and, uh, uh, and the likes. Um, or perhaps it's going to be people that are formerly religious. They used to, you know, they went to yeshiva, they went to this, they went to that, but they they fell off. And those types of people are typically the most vocal in their animosity towards you becoming more religious, you becoming more committed uh, than they are. Um, and I believe that one of the reasons, one of the reasons is uh, because by looking at you becoming committed to Torah, to mitzvot, to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to having Yirat Shemaim, to having these restrictions and limitations for, for your own good, it actually reminds them of their failure. It reminds them that they are spineless. It reminds them that they have no word. Why? Because they, in essence, either used to be as religious or are still somewhat religious, but they know they're not, a, they're not as committed. And subconsciously, they know it's wrong. Subconsciously, they know that it's, a, uh, it's not really, a, what they're doing is not 100% legit. But since they're surrounded by people that are more like them than you, they're comfortable with their life. And you make them uncomfortable. This is why you'll see most people that are haters on our videos or Rabbi Mizrahi's videos um, are not the secular atheist that you would think it is, are not the uh, Christian uh, fanatics that you would think it is. It's not some imam and his Muslim brotherhood. It's, no, who is it? It's people that are either formerly religious or still semi-religious. Um, that are the most fanatic about attacking us, attacking the truth. Why? Because again, again, it shows that we are simply a mirror. We are a mirror that is going to remind you of your own failures, in so many words. Not to insult you, but simply in hopes that you'll do tshuva. Um, and unfortunately, today in the world, more and more people have uh, become spineless with a, a word that simply doesn't exist, a, uh, um, an attitude that has no substance to it, no, uh, no, real, uh, no real honor in it. And this really is one of the things that was happening at the time of Avraham Avinu. We see that Avraham Avinu continuously runs into these shady characters, whether it's Nimrod, who called himself a god, 
uh, you know, and even though he knew, he knew that he's a faker, especially after seeing that Avram, uh, you know, ju he jumped into the fire and his God, Kadosh Baruch Hu, saved him. And Nimrod knew all of this and he ended up sending his son, Eliezer, with Avram. But yet he continued being a con man. He continued being a faker. You know, and then you see later on, you see Ephron in last week's parasha. Ephron promises the world. He was a nobody before uh, this, this parasha. And he was just some, uh, some guy that gives traffic tickets in the city. Nobody knew who he was even. But then when Avram Avinu asked about Ephron, the Midrash says, all of a sudden the people of that town said, oh, who? Avram, the, the man of God, the, the, the president in the department of, uh, of, of God's department over there. He's, a, uh, uh, he's asking about Ephron. Ephron must be an uh, important person. Instantly they upgraded him. They gave him a promotion in his job. And Ephron initially said, oh, I'm getting all this kavod, all this honor as a result of this uh, Avram. So now Avram wants to speak to me. So he came to speak to him. And Avram says, yeah, I want to buy the Me'arat uh, HaMachpelah from you. And the Midrash says something amazing. Before this conversation, Ephron never went inside. Never went inside the Me'arat HaMachpelah. And the reason why is because any time he would come close to the Merat HaMachpelah, all he would see is darkness, and then the demons, the demons would start attacking him to get him away from the, uh, from the Merat HaMachpelah, because they didn't want him to see that the holiness that was actually in it, Adam Arishon is in it, Chava is in it, they didn't want him to see the holiness and the secrets of the Merat HaMachpelah, so they would chase him away. So Ephron hated this place, hated this place, he didn't think it was worth anything. And what ended up happening is that uh, initially he said, yeah, Avram, you want to feel? No, sure, you can have it for free. You can have it for free. But then the Midrash says that Avram had his hand in his uh, pocket or something that's like a pocket, and a few shekels came out. You know, a few dollars came out, and Ephron all of a sudden, his eyes lit up. Saw money, all of a sudden, you know... Free, free, but what's 400, you know, what's 400 zoos between us? Meaning, what's like $4 million between us? It's free, but $4 million is nothing, though. What happened? What's free $4 million is a world apart? That's what happened. Spineless people, have no word. Have no word. This, unfortunately, happens. Happens time and time again. You see this Abimelech. Abimelech has no word. Constantly cheating, constantly lying. You know, we have they have a deal on one uh, well, and he wants another well, and another well, another well. He keeps uh, keeps cheating. Lot, Lot, same exact thing. And you see throughout the entire Torah, spineless characters are constantly trying to attach themselves to the righteous people. Constantly. And uh, this is unfortunate. This is an unfortunate situation in the world, meaning that it actually doesn't matter how righteous you are, the spineless people exist. And unfortunately, they will try to uh, take advantage of you. They'll try to do whatever they can to hurt you sometimes um, for, for their own benefit. Spineless, you know, so just because somebody does tshuva and somebody becomes religious, doesn't mean that the whole world around him becomes religious right away. You know, it's a, uh, you're going to have different challenges. Um, I, uh, I can tell you that the, although, uh, Baruch Hashem, our life is a million times better today than it was when we were on Wall Street, uh, you know, making millions and so on, but that doesn't mean that we don't have tests. Tests come in every day, whether it's the situation that we have right now with having a space or it's the moving, uh, you know, anybody that's been following me for a few years, knows how many times we've had to move since we moved to Florida. Almost every year we're moving, uh, and it's not because we don't pay uh, the rent. It's just simply different tests, different people, different unusual circumstances. Um, and uh, the same thing goes with, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, doing Kiruv and helping people and so on, you're going to deal with sometimes with people that are spineless. Uh, just uh, recently there was some person that uh, decided that Four months after he donated fifteen hundred dollars to help us do good things in the world, feed poor people, and so on, he decided that he doesn't want to donate. So what does he do? He sends a message to his credit card. No, no, I didn't mean to donate fifteen hundred dollars. Now, if you bought something 
and you didn't like it after a few months, but you pretended like you just, you know, you're cheating the store in the store or whatever, or the store has a policy that you're allowed to return it. It's doubtful if that's permissible or not permissible. And generally speaking, it's most likely not permissible according to the Torah. But if you ever donated money and then you decided that you want to undonate, in essence, you want the refund from it, if you donated that money to a petting zoo, yeah, most, you know, it's possible that it's allowed for you to take it because you're wasting your money anyway, the petting zoo. But if you donated your money to Torah and even if you wanted the money back a week later, forget about uh, uh, three, four months later, a week later, uh, you're making a very big mistake. Why? Because once that money, according to the Torah, once the money was donated to Torah, it's like it was donated to the Bet Mikdash, meaning it was donated to Hashem. If it's a legitimate organization, uh, which we're working very, very hard on being, uh, that legitimate organization, that Baruch Hashem, everything goes to its Torah, cue of helping people and so on. So what ends up happening is that a person now wanted to do a mitzvah, he donated money, donated a thousand dollars, donated a hundred dollars, donated whatever he donated. And then he decided, the Yetzirah showed up, got into his head, took over the steering wheel and said, no, no, you know what, why don't you just call the credit card company and dispute this charge, you'll have an easy thousand two thousand dollars back in your account you know let's just get it over with you know it's it's much easier than going to work it's much easier get the money back by simply disputing the charge now he thinks that oh what's the big deal i donated now i donate what's the big deal it's just like uh sometimes you buy a product sometimes you return it wrong why at that moment that he disputed the charge he not only lost that mitzvah that he originally did but now he got a sin. What sin? Gezel, stealing. But not just any type of gezel. The worst type. What type? Gezel from God. He officially is considered as if somebody that stole from God. And that's a very, very serious problem. Why? Because God knows where you live. God knows where you are. God knows who gave you the money, which is Him. And unfortunately, such a person is not only a person that shows himself to be spineless uh, but uh, to the people that he's hurting and so on but also he's putting a curse on himself he's putting a curse on himself which is a curse of Ahu because now he's considered somebody that stole from the Torah like stole from the Bet HaMikdash and it's sad it's a sad situation you feel bad for that person because there's nothing you can do all you can do is uh, you could uh, uh, you know Pray that they do tshuva, but believe me, this has happened more times than you can imagine. It's not time. I mean, right? You know, just recently, somebody did that. I'm telling you a story that is happening, but it's not the first time. Last time I went to New York, or maybe two times ago, I went to New York. We had a couple of events. Uh, Baruch Hashem had a bunch of people in the, in the events, and one of the events, you know, usually I mean, events. Uh, the way I am, I, you know, I know that. Uh, the way it's, you know, other speakers are, most other speakers are, they charge a fee for uh, for going uh, to speak somewhere at three, five, ten, twenty thousand, whatever they want to charge. Plus, you have to pay for room and board and all those different things. Baruch Hashem, you know, we uh, I've been doing it the way my rab has uh, told us to do it, which is don't charge anything. Uh, if they could pay for a flight, good, but many times they don't, and you still go. But uh, you tell them, listen, if you could please donate some money that would help but you have an understanding that that it's a uh it's not like if you could donate a hundred dollars like if you could you know raise some money for us so it's actually worth it for us that it's equivalent to something substantial like you would pay some no you know other speaker that charges anyway uh you're going you're going to do the lecture whether they pay you or they don't pay you why? Because you're doing it for, for the sake of Torah. But you're hoping that there is, you know, people actually donate. You can do, continue to do this because if you keep paying for your own lectures and your own travel and your own everything else, you're not going to survive. So anyway, so I had this guy who was chasing me to do a lecture at his place for months. Months. Finally, I told him, listen, fine. I'm going to, you know, I'm coming to New York. 
if you can commit to bring in a few hundred people, at least, you know, 150, 250 people, I think it was 150 or 250, whatever the number was, at the time, I'll come. Uh, yeah, 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 he talked to my assistant, yeah, we'll raise some money, we'll do this, we'll do that, whatever. Long story short, we went to New York, and um, we did the lecture. The turnout wasn't as good as I hoped it was, but it was okay, but it was not nowhere near as much as what it should have been. He didn't market it as good as he should, and so on and so forth. But, whatever, we did the lecture, Baruch Hashem. It was a decent lecture. I think the people that were there enjoyed it. And um, after the lecture, usually what ends up happening is that the people give me the money, and I, and I leave. After, the, after I meet with everybody, and I talk to everybody, and deal with personal issues, and so on. The guy that's, you know, that held the lecture, or different people individually, give me some money, and I leave after that. In this particular event, the guy, uh, you know, sees me outside after I finish. I think by the time we finish, it was maybe like, uh, I don't know, two o'clock in the morning, uh, and uh, maybe even later. Anyway, the guy sees me, go, oh yeah, listen, we love the lecture, it was great, well, amazing, this, that, okay, great, well, and he says, uh, and he's in his car, and he's like, listen, I'm gonna put all, I got all the money from everybody, I'm gonna put everything, I'm just gonna simply send you a check. This is an unusual, unusual, what do you need to send me a check for? If people gave you money, and you got some money, and so on, just give me the money. What happened? You guessed it. Nothing. He never gave us the money. Zero. Nothing. Not for travel, not for food, not for board, not for nothing. And on top of it, he stole all the money that everybody else gave him for me. Now, for the sake, not of money, for the sake of his neshama, because there's no chuva from this. There's no chuva from something like this. He'd have to come back in a gilgul in order to fix something like this. There's no chuva. For the sake of his own neshama, I had two different assistants that I have call him almost every week for months just to tell him, send the money because it's not your money. You're stealing money here. Whatever, he doesn't want to donate, don't donate. But the money that other people donate, send that money. He wouldn't answer the phone. He dodged them, he'd hang up, this, that. Eventually, we just gave up. Now, this guy, he thinks he's 100% religious. When I talked to him, when he came to Florida to visit and so on and so on, before this whole fiasco happened, yeah, zealous for Hashem, la, do, do, all those different things. <laughs> Garbage. Garbage. Why? When it came, push came to shove, when it came to money, the person simply became spineless. And unfortunately, there are many, many people like this. We deal with them all the time. We deal with them all the time. This is why I always tell people, I don't like to talk about money with people. Like, if you want to donate, just donate. Don't talk to me about it. Don't convince me about it. Don't have me want to... I don't want to do it. Why? It's just not worth it. If I wanted to talk about money, I'd go to Wall Street. I'd go, you know, talk about big money and things like that. But it's just, it's just not worth it. I, trust me, we need to raise a lot of money. And, and I have this inner battle right now of whether I have to start calling people to ask them for money because we need to raise a lot of money and it's a lot more than what we're doing now. But it's a problem. It's a very serious problem because people, unfortunately, um, are not, uh, don't stand up for their word. And what ends up happening is that there's a Mishnah. It's a Mishnah, the Chachamim say, that uh, Akadosh, to, to show how much Akadosh Baruch Hu doesn't like people that don't have a word, he says, the people that don't have a word, that don't, that say something and don't hold to it, Hashem will destroy them just like He destroyed the generation of the flood. That's it. Why? Because when a person says one thing and does something else, he promises one thing and does something else, it's the antithesis of Judaism. It's the opposite of God. So this Rabotai is simply one of those things where a person needs to be very careful with the things that he says. Uh, she needs to be very careful with things she says. Don't uh, make empty promises, whether it be in business or, or and otherwise. Uh, you have to simply stand up to your word, do what you have to do, and that's it. Do people make mistakes? Sure, but there's a mistake. And then there's a mistake, you know, there's, sometimes the mistake is not really a mistake, it's just a desire. 
uh, that you could overcome. So you have to make sure that you don't destroy your own neshama and, and ruin all that hard work. Uh, you know that you're spending on, on uh, you know, doing mitzvot and Shabbat and uh, you know yeshiva and something else. Because if a person is not going to be honest, it's not going to be honest in their life. Not going to have a word. They could lose olam haba just like that, just like that. That's it. So easy to lose olam haba. So easy. People don't understand how easy it is to lose olam haba. You go to the shas. You go to the shas. It literally seems like every chapter has a few mentions of how somebody could lose Allah Abba. If people only knew how easy it is to lose Allah Abba, and losing Allah Abba is not like losing keys. Losing Allah Abba means the person goes to gain no permanently. That's what it means. That's 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 pretty much what losing Allah Abba means. If people understood how easy it is to lose Allah Abba, uh, they'd be scared to talk. They'd be scared to walk anywhere. They'd be scared to do anything. So you have to, you know, you're already doing so much work, you're learning Torah, you're doing mitzvot, you're keeping Shabbat, you're, do, you're doing so much, it's really foolish to lose it just because of, you know, some inner weakness. Yeah, if you, have, if you say something, do it. Do it, don't be spineless, don't steal from people, don't cheat people, don't have hidden agendas. And, and, and only say something or do something because you want some you have some vested interest in it just be emit you know be like a real person be an honest person and just just do it and if you if you if you see yourself like leaning in a in, in something in a biased way just walk away don't do the deal walk away that's it don't do the don't say nothing don't do nothing walk away walk away Maybe you come back after you calm down and the desire has calmed down. But if you see yourself getting out of control where it's like you're already starting to salivate over the, the, the prey you're about to eat up, walk away. Walk away. It's not worth it. Why? Because you could lose Olam Abba just like that. My mind's just like that. You could lose Olam Abba in, in, in moments and, and people simply don't value, don't value their, their life um at all they honestly don't value their life at all because they treat their life like it's a uh i don't know bag of chips or something you know by by making these stupid statements or these stupid promises they can't keep or reneging on deals that they committed to or all types of things like that don't do it don't ruin your life that way by being a, a liar. Hashem hates liars. Uh, it's a really dumb thing to do. And needless to say, it hurts people. It hurts people. You have to really start learning something um, that it's called empathy, which is like being able to put yourself in other people's shoes and knowing that you know, before you take the action, obviously, not after, knowing that this action that you're going to do, it's going to hurt somebody. It's going to hurt somebody. Like, if you're going to, if you're going to cheat somebody out of money, if you're going to, you know, kick somebody out, if you're going to, uh, you know, do whatever, anything, anything that's, that's say, uh, going to hurt somebody, you have to think about that. Like, how, how is that person going to deal with you? You can't be so self-centered to the point where it's like ah, i don't care we have a whole manage she'll do it she'll do it who cares you can't be you know you can't be so uh delusional that um that you just don't care about anybody else but yourself because uh, what can i tell you it, it, it'll make you a uh a, it'll make you a very very tough life very tough life. Why? Because whatever you do, at some point, Hashem has to pay you for it, either good or bad. And if you do bad stuff to people, that means that you are on the IOU list. Hashem's IOU list. I owe you a punishment. And some of that is going to come in this world. It's not just the next world. So you stole money from somebody, you cheated somebody, you hurt somebody, you broke somebody's heart, you uh, you manipulated somebody in some way, 
guess what? Yeah, it may look like you're winning right now. It may look like you're doing great now. You're you're you got your muscles up and you know you got your smile from ear to ear, and it looks like you're winning. Okay, just just wait a little bit. Wait a little bit. You know, wait a little bit, and you'll see how in the kamot Hashem, in the kamot ofia, the God is a God of vengeance. Is Hashem, the God of vengeance has arrived. We read that Tehillim every Wednesday when we pray every Wednesday to remind ourselves to remind ourselves don't mess with a Kadosh Baruch Hu. you broke one of his daughter's hearts no it's just dating who told you you're allowed to touch her if you're just dating no why we were just friends I didn't know it's gonna lead to that okay you didn't know it's gonna lead to that it led to that and you did what you did okay now Kadosh Baruch Hu has to break you to pieces why because you broke his daughter's heart well, but I didn't mean it that way. Didn't mean it, mean it. You did it, bottom line. You cheated, you lied, you did this, you did that. Our Kadosh Baruch Hu wants to do it to you, bottom line. That's the thing, people don't understand it. And that's why I highly recommend that you just go to like some nursing home or go to a hospice center uh, or, or just go to a place where there's a like an elder care. Like, you know, go see a bunch of older people and see how the vast majority of them, as soon as they start hitting their midlife, 55, 65, 70s, once they're in that point, you start seeing people like life hitting them in the face. Now, you're not always winning. Regardless if you have money, you don't have money. Regardless. You know, I have a guy who knows, he's got, I don't know, rich Koach, has money like Koach. Two of his sons died in the last three years. What kind of life is that? What kind of life is that? Uh, countless people, you see them. Their life, yeah, it looks like they're winning the first 20, 30 years, 40 years. Looks like they're winning. But then, boom! Kadosh Baruch Hu shows up. Why? You did this, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this. Kadosh Baruch Hu starts paying. Okay, let me start paying. Starts paying the bill. And that's not that's not even the, the, the real payment. The real payment is Hashem Echem. It's, it's, it's in the next world. But that's the thing, you gotta start thinking like that. You gotta start thinking before I cheat anybody, before I lie to anybody, before I, I take anything that doesn't belong to me, before I say anything that I don't mean. I gotta remember a Kadosh Baruch who's listening to every word, a Kadosh Baruch who's watching every single step that I take. Am I crazy to think that he's gonna miss this one? He's gonna let this one go? I mean, the Gemara itself says, anyone that says that a Kadosh Baruch Hu is a Vatran, he's just gonna let things go, in, increases his own punishment. Hakadosh Baruch Hu has to rip his innards, his, his intestines, into pieces. That's what it says. Mevatrim me'av. It's the literal language of the Gemara. Just for calling Hashem Mevatran, not even saying, just calling him. Ah, Mevatran, he's gonna let it go. Don't worry. I'll get along with Hashem. Just having that type of an attitude increases the punishment to such a high extent. So. I, I, I see this stuff all the time, all the time with people just almost incapable of being honest. It's almost like a deformity, like a defect in, in people's head to such an extent where it's almost like they are incapable of being honest, incapable of, of, of just having a word. They could say one thing and do something else at the same time and not even realize that it's them that's doing it. It's like sometimes you have somebody saying, oh yeah, I love Hashem, I'm there to do all these wonderful things, compliments about Hashem, while he's driving on Shabbat. While he's driving on Shabbat. And you think, is this guy crazy? Is he insane? Is there something wrong with him? It's just, they've gotten so used to lying in the world that... They start living the lie without even realizing it. Without realizing it. And it, it happens regularly. I mean, I just uh, like a month ago, two, two, two months ago, I met a neighbor. Uh, we were walking outside and on Shabbat. And uh, I don't know anybody here. And uh, the guy was driving on Shabbat. And he stopped his car. He opens the window. And he says, Shabbat Shalom to me in Hebrew. He's an Israeli guy. While he's driving on Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom. Like, he has no concept. The guy has no concept that he's saying Shabbat Shalom while violating Shabbat with, with, with one of the most vile things you can do, which is fire on Shabbat. 
And driving on Shabbat, Hashem Yishmol, is, is millions of fires, not just one fire. Millions of fires. So that's the thing, guys. You have to work on yourself. I have to work on myself. All of us have to work on ourselves to have a word, have a word. Like, uh, always do what you're going to say. Think about how things are going to affect people if, uh, if you're taking action uh, that has to do with other people. Uh, and really just uh, stick to the emit, not just when it comes to doing a specific mitzvah that you like, but stick to the emit in your day-to-day -day life. Day-to-day -day life. Because if you do that, your, uh, your spine will still have the peace that Hashem will use to resurrect you with the dead. If you don't, unfortunately, you'll be destroying your own resurrection. And chas v'shalom, why do that? Why do that? Okay, I've spoken for a lot longer than I thought. Let's see if you guys have some questions. Let's see the messages here. All right. Wonderful uh, shion, making sure. Thank you. Hi, everybody. In the weekly midrash, I read that Noah's father was saved in Gehenom for the merit of his son. It's from Art Scroll Book. Um, it's possible. I've mentioned that it's possible that um, a, uh, a per your personal tshuva could even fix the source of the uh, from previous generations. It is possible, yes. Um, I don't know if that was a question, but I guess I'm answering it anyway. Shall We could be done when we know how to see again. You're writing it one time, one time. Read it. Uh, are the four corners of the altar at all related to the four exiles? Four corners of the altar related to the four exiles. Uh, I'm sure that there is some type of a uh, uh, midrash or a commentary or a parable or analogy or something that uses the connection between them but uh, it's not the type of connection to the point where there is four exiles because there is four corners or there is four corners because there will be four exiles not like that I'm sure that you could learn something in a connection just like uh, uh, the Torah is used as an analogy, uh, you know, like symbolic of, let's say, by water. Uh, you know, one example is that, um, why is the Torah like water? Because, you know, water is continuing to flow, continuing to flow. It's a stream of water is going to continue to flow, just like the Torah is going to continue to flow. Now, what happens if you stop it? You stop water, the water is going to continue flowing, and then what's going to happen? You hit it, it's hitting. So what happens when it's hitting? It starts rising, 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 rising. You thought you stopped it, but the water is continuing to rise, rise. Eventually, it's going to overcome it, topple it, and move on forward. And that's, in essence, the Torah. A lot of people are going to try to get in the way of the Torah, the Amaleks, the Ed of Rav, the, the heretics, the, uh, the missionaries. All of those people, they're going to get in the way of the Torah. They're going to get in the way of the Torah, thinking they're going to stop it with all their weird rules and regulations and so on. But Torah is going to continue, you know, gather, 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 more chachami, more people doing tshuva, more, 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 eventually overcome the Rishayim, and the Rishayim will be disappeared out of this world, and uh, the Torah will continue, because that's the promise that Hashem uh, makes every single day, that the Torah will always be, Am Yisrael will always be. Um, so, sure, you could use symbolic things like that. Uh, same thing with the four corners of the altar and uh, the four exiles. Next question, is praying considered as learning Torah? Uh, interesting question. Uh, praying is not considered traditionally as learning Torah with the exception of certain places. Meaning, if you're praying, for example, Amida. Amida is one of the prayers that a Jew has to do. A male has to do it uh, uh, three times a day on Shachrit, Mincha, and Arvit, and on Rosh Chodesh four times. Because you have the Musaf on Shabbat four times because you have the Musaf. Uh, and um, the uh, Amidah is a prayer. 
It's not, it's not learning. On the other hand, Shema Yisrael is both. The section about Shema Yisrael is both. It's both prayer and it's learning. Why is it prayer and learning? Because it actually, it's prayer because we need to say it uh, at least twice a day, uh, in the morning and at night. But also it's verses from the Torah. It's verses from the Torah, which means that even if you said Shema Yisrael as a man, you're supposed to do Shema Yisrael at a certain time, before a certain time in the morning. Uh, so if, let's say for example, you're supposed to, the latest time to say Shema Yisrael uh, is let's say nine o'clock in the morning and you missed it. You, let's say you woke up at uh, 10 o'clock. So what do you do? You skip Shema Yisrael? No. You still say Shema Yisrael when you put on tefillin, even if it's four o'clock in the afternoon. You still do the Shema Yisrael when you put on your tefillin. Why? Because although it won't be fulfilling the mitzvah of prayer uh, uh, like it was supposed to on its time, on its time of uh, before nine o'clock like it was supposed to, you still say it because there's the benefit of saying the word of Torah, which is also considered learning Torah. Uh, and that's actually also why you'll notice that uh, in a, uh, especially Shachrit, Shachrit is very long, much longer than Mincha and Alvit. Uh, and part of the reason is because Shachrit includes different passages and different parts from across the, uh, the Torah, both the written and the oral Torah. It has some uh, uh, verses from the Chumash, it has some verses from the Tanakh itself, uh, Tehillim meaning, it has some places from the Gemara, from the Mishnah. So it actually has a bunch of different things in Shachrit, which means that even if somebody just does Shachrit, he still got some in it. Now, of course, this is not really supposed to be your learning, but, uh, but it seems like the, uh, uh, the sages instituted these uh, these extra uh, prayers in it, not extra, these prayers in such a way uh, where you have some oral Torah in it, you have some written Torah in it to, to save us, where at least we don't show up to Shemaim with zero learning Torah. Uh, you know, if somebody, let's say for example, doesn't learn Torah every day, but he prays. You know, he's going to go up to Shemaim and say, you don't, you, you don't learn Torah. Perhaps they could use and say, well, he didn't learn Torah per se, like he didn't, uh, you know, learn like he was supposed to, but at least he prayed, and in the praying, there was some learning. So again, it's not supposed to be used as learning, but the point is that this is like a, uh, something that uh, the, uh, if somebody has merits, that could potentially help them get themselves out of trouble. Either way, uh, learning is learning and praying is praying, meaning that when it's time to pray, you should pray. When it's time to learn, you should learn. You shouldn't learn while you pray. You shouldn't pray while you learn. Uh, uh, there's a time for each one, just like anything else in the world. Uh, but as I said, there is certain uh, passages and so on within the prayer. Next. Charlie is asking, if you're watching a long shiur and eat something, are you supposed to leave to make after meal blessing uh, or exempt because of the mitzvah of the shiur? Uh, interesting question. Um, the uh, if you're watching a shiur and you're eating um, now, if you're eating a uh, uh, bread, if you're eating bread, so which means that you'll have to uh, uh, do a birkat uh, mazon. If you do Birkat HaMazon, uh, Birkat HaMazon takes, you know, three, four, five minutes to do. So you don't want to miss the shoe. And what are you going to do about the Birkat HaMazon? You can't. So you cannot skip Birkat HaMazon because of the shoe. Uh, you have to see Birkat HaMazon. But if you don't want to, uh, if you don't want to uh, miss any time of the shoe, then what you should do is you should continue the meal. Meaning, just every so often, you have, first of all, you have 72 minutes after you finish eating to do Birkat HaMazon. So let's say you finished, uh, you don't have to pray do Birkat HaMazon uh, right away. You have 72 minutes. So if you know that this year is going to be done, let's say, within an hour, then you can wait until the year is finished, and then you do Birkat HaMazon. But if it's, let's say, you started the, uh, you know, the, uh, you finished eating, Five minutes after the shiur starts, and I'm the one that's doing the shiur, so my shiurs are typically two hours or longer. So you know I'm not finishing in an hour. 
So what are you going to do? Uh, if you don't want to uh, miss any part of the shiur, no problem. Every uh, half hour or so, every 20 minutes or so, take a little bite of some chip or something to just continue the meal or even a drink. And continue the meal, uh, where each time you take a drink, each time you take a, a bite of something small even, uh, that you know buys you another 72 minutes. Another 72 minutes. So in essence, you are uh, restarting the clock of 72 minutes. So all you gotta do is, let's say for a shiur like mine, it's let's say two hours, three hours. Uh, all you gotta do is take a, a couple of bites, and uh, you could do the berakat amazon after you uh, after we finish the shiur. Um, so so that's that. Uh, so that's how you could do it. But you're not definitely not exempt from saying the after blessing. As far as the after blessings for uh, for the other things like mezonot, which is the me'ain shalosh or the borei nefashot for shakol. Those are short enough that you could just do them quickly. It's, uh, you know, it doesn't, uh, you're not going to miss much of, much of the shiur. Just do them and then get back to the shiur. Uh, next question. Jacob is asking, uh, in working on bitachon, what is the best way to conquer subconscious worry or fear, even when we know that Hashem orchestrated all of it? Example, our company is being put through a hostile takeover. And I accept it. Nevertheless, the new company made uh, made require uh, is requiring us to relocate to either Cleveland or Boston, and we just purchased a new townhouse. I'm confident that no matter what, Hashem orchestrated it. But it's not easy on my wife and kids, and there is pushback. How do you deal with that? Ah, okay. So. In regards to bitachon in general, it's uh, as we learned from the Chazonish, is that bitachon is not just a having confidence that everything's going to be okay, but rather, uh, and more precisely, is that whatever happens is the best possible thing either way. Meaning, there is no bad. Whatever is the outcome is the best possible outcome that's available to us. So in such a case, when you know that it's not only that it's a Shem that is uh, orchestrating it, but whatever he chooses, whatever he chooses to give you, whether it's to live in, live in Cleveland or li- live in Honolulu or wherever it is, whatever happened, that is the best possible thing that could have been. And there was no other choice, meaning you should never think, oh, If this didn't happen, then we would have still been in Cleveland. Oh, if this didn't happen, then we would still be in New York. No, whatever you have, that's it. And believe me, I'm dealing with it right now. We just moved uh, to Cooper City uh, and uh, we looked for a bunch of different houses. That was a story of its own. We finally found a house. And, um, you know, where uh, we moved into it, it's a uh, uh, nice house, bigger than what we needed, but it was the one that worked for us. And Baruch Hashem, we moved and we figured, okay, this is going to be it. And we were sure that um, this made sense because not only the deal worked, but also it was right next to a commercial space for us to open the synagogue that we wanted to, to build and, and so on and so forth. As you would have it, we moved to the house, everything is good with the house, but the, as I told you in the beginning, the whole synagogue thing didn't work out because the landlord doesn't want a synagogue. So, okay, fine, we figured, okay, let's find another place, go the other direction. That didn't work out either. Okay, let's go a little further. So what's happening now? As of right now, pretty much we have zero next to us. And the only thing that we saw that was a possibility of being available to us is something that's far enough to the point where we're going to have to move again. <laughs> we have to move again, which is a nightmare. But, it, but, but that's the thing. My wife and I started laughing about it. And despite being concerned, it's like, oh, we finally have, you know, a place. We're okay and everything's okay. And now ah, we have to move again. So what is the bitachon? Bitachon is Baruch Hashem. Why? If we have to move, that means that moving is for our best interest. It is the best possible thing in the world, despite the difficulty. And if we don't have to move in the end, after all said and done, if it doesn't actually end up happening and we end up finding something else, 
then that means that worrying about moving this whole time would have been a waste. So that's what I suggest. I suggest that you understand clearly and watch the last two lectures in the Chazonish series that we did, the last two especially, because it talks about this topic extensively, is that know that there is nothing that you can do uh, to change the future, if you will, to change the circumstances. You have certain choices available to you that Hashem is, in essence, working with. And whatever happens, whether it's to move to a different state or to stay the same one or whatever it is, what, that's the best thing available to you, to, to bring you good, to, to, to save you from something, to help you with something. So accept it as this is the gift from Hashem for a million and a half reasons that I, I may never know until you, know, you meet Him. Uh, one day after 120. Uh, on the other hand, if the choice that he ends up picking is that you don't have to move, then worrying about it this whole time was just a waste. So if your wife says, listen, I'm worried, I don't want to move, I really like this house, we finally have a house, and I don't want to move, you simply tell her, honey, we don't know if we have to move right now. Why should we worry about something that hasn't happened yet? On the other hand, if it's you have a confirmation, listen, we got to move. And she says, oh, but I don't want to move. Well, we have to move uh, because of the company has to move. Okay, so how do you make that work? You can make it work where uh, perhaps you can move temporarily until the deal is done. So you can keep your house while renting a house in a new state for let's say the next year or two until the deal is done. Or better yet, uh, you could uh, you know, you could do something else where I mean, it's a little more difficult, but you can travel. You could travel uh, part of the week. Or best yet, which is actually much more likely and, 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 and more acceptable today, is that uh, because they're acquiring uh, the company to move, you could say, listen, I can't move right away. I want to re work remotely which really right now, a lot of companies are having their employees work remotely. One of my students uh, who's uh, you know, in, in uh, Silicon Valley, he, uh, he recently uh, said his whole company went remote, like even after coronavirus is, um, uh, is done and they have a cure, which I don't think is ever gonna happen, but let's say they do, uh, a cure that actually doesn't kill people, um, they, uh, they're not going to come back to an office. Why? It doesn't make sense to them anymore. Why have this whole big structure of office and so on? You could just do everything that you do from working with your pajamas. So they ended up giving everybody a raise because they don't have to spend money on real estate anymore. And uh, everybody's working out of their house. And now, of course, everybody has to have goals and, and, and so on. Now, this is not easy to manage for certain businesses, but the point being is that you have some choices in your hand, even if you do have to move. But until then, don't worry about it. Don't worry about something that you have no control over. And once it happens, know that this is the best thing that Hashem uh, is, uh, is able to give you out of the choices that are available to you. Um, it's for your own best interest. And you know, work with it. Work with it. Work with it in a way that this is a, uh, a gift from Hashem for countless different reasons. Sometimes... It takes us time to realize why it's a gift, but nonetheless, it's always a gift. So, next uh, question. Um, so, okay. I, Moshe. Jason, okay. I'm not an Orthodox, but my rabbi is Khalidi. I love my rabbi because he gives me a higher standard to strive for. Jason, you should be like your rabbi. Meaning, not the title, Khalidi, but definitely not the title, Modern. Why? Because to call yourself Modern Orthodox simply means that you are accepting, accepting the notion that you can change the Torah, which is wrong, obviously. Now, I know you, Jason, you're a good guy, and I know that you don't agree with that. But that's what that name implies. That name implies that you are willing to change the Torah. Why? Because in essence, what modern orthodoxy is today, it's not what it was when uh, the uh, uh, the um, the big rabbinim started it. 
uh, so it's a uh, it's, it's a very very uh, very different modern Orthodox than it was when it first started. Today's modern Orthodoxy is nothing like what it was first started. Simple to how conservative uh, Judaism is nothing like today what it was, you know, even 50, 60 years ago. Back then, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, modern Orthodoxy was very, very similar to, I'm sorry, uh, 50, 60 years ago, conservative Judaism was very similar to modern Orthodoxy today. They kept Shabbat 60 years ago. Today, they, you know, they, they do anything, but that, that's what happened 60 years ago with, with conservative. It, they started driving on Shabbat. So modern orthodoxy, in essence, is a, today, the way it's presented is that it's saying that you could change the Torah. Whereas Haridi, by definition, means that you're Charit for Divrei Hashem. You are committed to the Word of God. So I would recommend that you be committed to the Word of God. And if there is something that is difficult for you to do, say, this is difficult for me to do, but nonetheless, I need to do it. And I'm going to try my best to aspire to do it at some point. And I'm never going to accept that, you know, the, uh, the, uh, that this is uh, not being done. I'm going to do it at some point, and I'm going to work on it, but it's hard for me to do right now. But whereas when, if you call yourself modern orthodox, in essence, what you're saying is that, listen, he is going to do that. I don't accept that you need to do it. I'm going to do something else. And that's a pathway to a bad place. And that's unfortunately what happened with conservative. Uh, conservative is today's modern orthodoxy. Uh, it's an acceptance of modernizing, if you will, the Torah. Uh, which is in essence the same, that you can change the Torah. It's a disaster. So I highly recommend you become more like your rabbi. And uh, Hashem, I, uh, again, forget the, the name, but just the mentality, the ideology is that uh, it's being committed to it. It's either 100% true or it's fake. Simple. If it's 100% true, I'm going for it. Now, there's certain things that are hard for me. Fine, they're hard for me, but they're still true. But if I'm modern orthodox, you can pretty much... What, what's the mentality? Listen, it's true, but you don't have to do it. If you don't have to do it, it's not true. Bottom line. So, so that, that's the thing. It's, it's important to know that there is a... Uh, ideological difference that uh, is uh, very, 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 very big between the modern orthodoxy world today than the Haredi world today, and even the modern orthodoxy today versus the modern orthodoxy of 50 years ago. Next, Joseph Lott. Uh, is there a deeper significance or chidush that you might have about why the Torah is written in a third person by Moshe? Uh, well, the first four books, the first four books out of the five books of Moses uh, were uh, uh, dictated by God, meaning at Mount Sinai, God told Moshe Rabbeinu what to write, and he told him what to write from Bereshit, Bara Elokim et Hashanayim et Aretz, until Parashat Itro, which is the event of Mount Sinai. So he told them everything to write until what happened at Mount Sinai. And that is what he told them. Now, what about the next part of it until the fifth book of the Torah? Over the next 40 years, every so often, Hashem would come to Moshe Rabbeinu in prophecy and tell him what to write, which means that Hashem would tell Moshe what to write, and that's why it's written in such a way that it's in third person, because it's a Shem, in essence, conversation with Moshe. Now, in the fifth book of the five books of Moses, that's actually Moshe Rabbeinu wrote that from his own perspective, and that's why it changes. It's a first person. He's saying, I spoke to God. I, you know, instead of Moshe spoke to God, it says, I spoke to God. Why? Because the fifth book of Moses is actually Moshe's journal, Moshe Rabbeinu's journal that he wrote over, over throughout his life. And, uh, and what ended up happening is that Hashem made that, he told Moshe, make this the fifth book. 
So in essence, you have five books of Moses. In reality, really, it's, it, was, it was really a, uh, there was seven parts to the Chumash, but uh, it's still the same Chumash, just it was separated differently uh, at different times. But nonetheless, same five books of Moses, same word, same everything. But the point being is that the, uh, the last part of the Chumash, last part of the five books of Moses, is from first person because it's Moshe's perspective. The first four is from God's perspective. God is saying to do everything. God is dictating it. So in essence, whoever he's talking to, whether it's Avraham Avinu or it's Moshe or it's anybody else, it is from God's perspective, not from um, the, uh, the human perspective. Good question. How can you conceptualize Hashem's oneness better? En od milvado. En od milvado. There's nothing else like Him. There's nothing else but Him. Uh, he is one with Himself, meaning you as a human being, me as a human being, we are parts. Our body is parts. Our Thoughts are parts, meaning your body is different parts, but even you are separate from your thoughts. Hashem, on the other hand, there is no parts. He is one, meaning his thoughts are his reality. The past, present, and future are all one. They're all happening simultaneously. There is no difference to him between the past, present, and future. It's all the same thing. The beginning and the end, he already sees at at that already saw at that moment. There was there is no there is no uh, past, present, future for him. Uh, now, to truly understand uh, the concept of oneness is impossible for a human being because we are part, so therefore we cannot understand something that is one. But what I said is like again, you could. Uh, it's the we are the opposite. Of what he is, we are parts, and he is one. Uh, we are separate from our thoughts and and, and, and our uh, body. He is not. We live in past, present, and future. He doesn't. He lives all. It's, it's you know there is no concept of time for him. The past, present, and future is all uh, the same to him. Next, uh, Susan, the Satan is working hard to prevent Rabbi. Okay, Baruch Hashem. Yeah, he is working hard, but we're gonna try. Zot Hashem. I try to keep working. Uh, let's see, Mike. Uh, in the morning blessing, it says, "Grant us this day and every day grace, kindness, and mercy in your eyes and in the eyes of all who behold us." Why do some people have charisma? Are they liked and are able to influence and persuade others? Uh, other people are quiet, and you hardly know they're there. Can a person develop charisma, and is there, and is this a sign, a conception, like a strength or of intelligence? So it's actually uh, charisma, if you will. It's called chen, and chen is something that Hashem gifts a person. Hashem, uh, Hashem gifts a person chen. Some people have a special chen that they're born with, uh, and and some can earn it through actions. Uh, some are born with it but end up losing it because of their actions. Some can gain it uh, as a result of their actions. Meaning, the more a person does the will of Hashem, the more chen they're going to have. But again, all chen, all charisma is not alike. Your charisma is different than my charisma. My charisma is different than his charisma. Everybody has a different type of chen, a different uniqueness. Uh, similar to your fingerprint, even though we our fingerprints will look alike to a uh, to a person that's uh, perhaps not an expert in it, but nonetheless, to a person that is an expert, in it, they'll see that there's a world of difference between our finger. Same thing with the charisma and, and the uh, personalities of people. Just like their faces are different, their thoughts are different. Next question, Nikolai. Uh, if a woman gives birth to twins, which one is the firstborn? The first out or the last one? First one is the uh, firstborn. If the last one, then why did Esav get the firstborn rights? Shouldn't he have? Shouldn't have been Yaakov? Didn't Yitzchak know that concept as well? 
No, uh, uh, Esav was the firstborn. Esav was the firstborn. He's the one that came out first. And uh, Yaakov was only called Yaakov because he came out second and he was holding on to the heel of Esav. Uh, but Esav disrespected his firstborn rights and he sold them for, a, uh, for the price of a stew, for a stew. Uh, he sold his firstborn rights to Yaakov. So, uh, and, and actually the Chachamim uh, uh, debate this whole issue. How could Yaakov do such a thing where he would, uh, you know, fool, if you will, fool Esav into uh, selling him the uh, firstborn rights for just stew? I mean, it's not just firstborn rights, be- you know, firstborn rights means the blessings, the, the, the place in the world, eternity, and so on, the inheritance. Firstborn in, in Judaism means a lot. Uh, so how could Yaakov, as righteous as he was, how could he uh, get uh, Esav to do such a thing? Uh, so uh, Chachamim explained it's because it's not that Yaakov fooled uh, Esav into selling his firstborn rights, but rather Esav disrespected the value of the firstborn rights, and therefore he deserves to lose it. Uh, there's where he deserves it. Yaakov did not cheat him out of anything. Yaakov was allowed to take something that he disrespected. And you know, the fact that he disrespected it is not Yaakov's problem. And therefore, he's allowed to take it. Good question. Um, Tatiana, Kodarav, is women's modesty related to infertility? Uh, it very much could be. It depends on a person. I mean, there are plenty of uh, real life examples I have seen with my own eyes of uh, women that uh, were uh, not covering their hair um, and uh, not fulfilling the mitzvah of modesty or worse yet they were walking around immodest and uh, Hashem uh, you know simply did not give them kids and uh, when they spoke to someone that's a very influential uh, speaker and he told them listen if you're willing to take on modesty 100% and cover your hair with a mitpachat. Uh, we'll pray for you to have a uh, child. And uh, the women did it, and it, it, exactly that happened. They had, the girl had a child, and it's not, not one story or two stories, it's dozens, dozens, dozens of stories. I've seen it with my own eyes. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know, women that uh, we've talked to and so on. It's. Uh, uh, so definitely one of the reasons why Hashem sometimes will uh, uh, make a woman not able to bring a child to the world is because of immodesty. Uh, but that's not the only reason because of course we know that Sarai Menu and Rivka, all of the matriarchs were very modest, but yet they were, uh, they, had, they were barren. Why? It had nothing to do with modesty. In that particular case is because he wanted their prayers. He wanted their special unique prayers. To make them the matriarchs, he wanted them to pray. Same thing with Chana. Chana had to pray uh, for years in order to uh, to bring uh, children to the world, in order to break the uh, the barrier and finally bring Shmuel to the world. Uh, but once she once she did, Hashem brought her a person that was uh, you know equivalent in his generation to having uh, Moshe and Aaron together. Uh, you know, and so. This obviously was not because she had an immodesty problem, but because Hashem wanted her prayer. Sometimes a, uh, a marriage will not have uh, children for different reasons. It could be, uh, you know, even sometimes the husband is wasting seed. Uh, so he's, uh, that, that could be a reason. Or the, or the woman is doing something like that. But also, sometimes bringing a child to the world is uh, not, their, not part of their, the, the people's tikkun. Meaning that they already fulfilled that part of their tikkun in the previous life. Uh, and Chachamim tell us that a uh, couple that's married uh, and is typically um, you know, a, uh, together in other carnations too. Meaning that you were with your husband also in the previous carnation. It wasn't necessarily somebody else, each carnation. It was the same neshama. Unless the last one was extremely righteous and he didn't have to come back. But if he had to come back, what Hashem usually does is that he connects the, uh, the, the husband and the wife in every carnation. 
but anyway, what could be is that sometimes a person, a couple could already have a child, fulfill the mitzvah of pulbu, and therefore, when they come back to the world again because to, to, to finish their mission, Hashem sometimes doesn't give them children because they've already fulfilled the mission of having children. So He doesn't want to bring them children for, for multiple reasons. One of them is because they've already fulfilled the mitzvah of bringing children. Another reason could be because He doesn't want to give them the obstacles that come with children and so on. Uh, or perhaps He wants to give them some suffering that comes with not having children. Uh, because that will add to their uh, to their to their merit. Uh, so the the point being is that you we since we don't know whether it's to our merit or it's a punishment or it's a Hashem wants more of our prayers or it's this or it's that. Since we don't know, what do we do? We pray and we pray and we pray and we pray and we do Chesed and we do Kiruv and we uh, you know we pray some more. And we help Am Yisrael, and we do all types of mitzvot that are connected to 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 bringing children to the world, which especially is kiru. Because if you care about Hashem's kids, Hashem surely is going to care about your kids. And if you don't have kids, He'll give you kids. And uh, the point is, is that you could do a lot of that, and uh, Hashem, do your ishtadlut in the uh, spiritual sense. Of course, modesty is a prerequisite to all of this, uh, and uh, and Hashem. Pray for Hashem to uh, make it clear to you one way or the other, either by bringing a child to the world or uh, by making it clear that this is not your tikkun. Uh, but definitely keep going. And even even if Chas Shalom, a woman, uh, you know, sees that, okay, her time is done, she can no longer have uh, children anymore, and she, uh, she didn't have as many children as she wanted or, or any at all, whatever it is, Chas Shalom, she should know Hashem is fine with that. Hashem is pleased with that. Why? He's the one that decided it. It wasn't her tikkun. It was to her benefit not to have the kids. And again, this is very hard for a woman. I mean, even Sarai Menu was, uh, says that uh, she feels like she's a dead person without it. Rivka, same thing. All the women, all the matriarchs were very, very hard for them to not have uh, children while they were barren. Uh, it's, it's very much a key part of life. I remember talking to one woman uh, you know that uh, you know uh, she's you know crying uh, right after the doctor visit where she got the doctor to tell her that she's not able to have kids anymore and she uh, you know she knew it was her fault because she waited too long it wasn't necessarily because of any other reason it was she just decided not to get married not to do anything until she was almost 50 years old and uh, in her case it was too late it was too late by the time everything got done. Everything was, I don't know, it was mid fifties. Uh, she wasn't able to have kids anymore, and that's it. You know. So, uh, but again, there are some women that are able to have kids even later. There's a woman in Israel that just gave uh, had a child that uh, I think she was sixty three years old, sixty four years old. Didn't she? So, it's the age is not the issue. The issue is, you know, it's a uh, uh, the blessing from Hashem. So we pray for Hashem to give us a kid. But if again, Chazav Shalom. Hashem does not give us that blessing that we should know that is a blessing also. Why? Because in essence, He is telling us this is not our tikkun. It's not our tikkun, uh, which means that at least in that department, you're, you've completed your job. Next question. Uh, Amen. Leah, if a non Jewish woman tells a Jew, that she's going to have a abortion. Is the Jew allowed to tell her not to about not to about and that she the, the Jew will take the baby with the hopes that the non Jew will change her mind when she sees her baby. And if the non Jew doesn't change her mind, is the Jew allowed to take the non Jewish baby? And how would that work? Very interesting. If you have a non-Jewish friend that tells you I'm going to have an abortion, you should definitely tell them not to. You should definitely tell them not to because, um, not just because um, to save the baby, uh, but also because to save your friend. Because if your non-Jewish friend has an abortion, she's committing murder and violating the seven Noahide laws. 
uh, which is a very serious problem. So it's we'll save two people by saving that baby. Now, even if that means you you want to promise that uh, uh, to keep the baby, you can, and uh, it's very possible that she'll change her mind and want to keep the baby. Also, you're right, and it's okay to do it. That's like one of those one of those places where the lie is uh, a white lie that's uh, helpful and even if you have to keep the baby you keep the baby and you just simply convert the baby as soon as the baby is born you take the baby and uh, you take to the go to the bedin and uh, you have a uh, you dip him in the mikveh if it's a boy you have a wait me on the eighth day and that's it it's your baby it's a uh, jewish baby and at that point you can no longer give it back to the uh, non-jewish mom even if she wants it back you can no longer give it back because now it's a jewish baby and Jewish baby can't be uh, taken back by the non-Jewish mom. So it's a very, you know, difficult issue. Most likely it won't happen in eight days. Most likely it will happen after. Uh, but the point is, is that uh, if you're going to take over the baby, then you have to make sure that you have lawyers involved and you sign all of the paperwork possible to not allow it to be undone. Because once you take over the baby as a Jew, the baby has to become Jewish. And you can no longer give it back. Uh because that would be like a uh, giving up a Jew, which is a disaster. So the best thing is to convince them to keep the baby. That's the best thing. Because it's not really normal for a woman to uh, carry a baby for nine months with the intention of uh, giving it away. It's not normal. It happens in the world, but it's not normal. Uh, next. Eliezer, Moshe Rabbeinu, and Yaakov Avinu all met virtuous women by a well of water. Please, what is the inner significance of water as related to the finding of virtuous women? It's not necessarily that the uh, water is a um, uh, a well is a uh, spiritually significant, but um, it's more logistically is that there uh, in those days there wasn't uh, Hashem, there wasn't nightclubs there wasn't a uh, bars and also there wasn't the freedom that people allow themselves today uh, which is to have the women and the men uh, walk outside together and mingle uh, and meet strangers whenever they want that was a uh, non-existent non-existent in fact in a uh, last week's palasha where uh it's actually is a, a beautiful beautiful midrash that uh a lot of people uh perhaps uh, may not know and uh it says that um yeah yeah it says in, uh, in chapter 24 of uh, Chaye Sarah, chapter 24, verse number uh, 16. And it says, meod betula, lo yada. It says that the maiden, meaning Rivka, was very fair, meaning she was very pretty to look upon, a virgin whom no man had known. Uh, so, first of all, it's important to know that this is not Eliezer's perspective. Eliezer didn't know that, uh, that Rivka was a virgin. There was no way for him to know. Second of all, um, if she's a virgin, then surely no man knew her. No man has been with her. Why, why is there a superfluous word? Chachamim explained in Midrash Rabbah, uh, and also in other places, that uh, Rivka was so modest, was so holy, that no man has ever seen her until that day. That was the first time she ever went to the well. First time she ever went to the well. Why? Because it was not common for women to go out and go into places that there would be men. So during the few times that they did, in essence, this was in essence what happened. So this, in essence, was a uh, uncommon event because the women of those days wouldn't typically go to the well and to outside and so on. It wasn't a common thing. 
women were reserved, women were, uh, even if they were out, they would not talk to some strange men. So this in itself logistically was an unusual event which led to um, uh, uh, big things, but the point being is that this unusual circumstances we see from the marriage and uh, you know was was decreed by Hashem. Next, uh, very Matthew Ari, very happy friend Rochelle recommended you. Okay, Baruch Hashem, thank you to Rochelle and also to Matthew for watching and learning with us. Um, Rav Mizrahi made a lecture about how to be more charismatic. Uh, yeah, sure, you could. I'm sure he did. Uh, I'm sure he did. Uh, Susan. Okay, I always pictured Hashem as an infinite light. I heard from Rabbi Elon that he is that he has a body, so to speak, so to speak. I always wondered how he could be everywhere simultaneously. So now I envision him as a body, and all the planets are encompassing within him, within this body of Hashem. Is this wrong to envision? Yes, it's wrong. Or could that answer the question that if everything is part of his body, then that would make it possible because everyone is in tune and no. Okay, so there is a specific a, uh, a, a clarity by the sages that en lo guf ve en lo demuta guf. Say one of our uh, thirteen principles of faith. Hashem has no body and has no likeness to a body, and the reason why uh, they're adamant about telling us that He has no body and He has no likeness of a body is because. A body, the way that the human mind, mind would envision, would limit Hashem, would limit Hashem's uh, being uh, to either be at a one place at a time, or one time at a time, meaning at a present, future, or past, and so on. So, therefore, we're not allowed to visualize Hashem with any type of body, nor even think that Hashem has any type of body, because He doesn't. He's not a light, He's not air, He's not uh, lightning, He's not sound. These are all His creations. These are all His creations. So He has no image whatsoever. No image whatsoever. Uh, what is He? How is He? He's God. That's it. That's all. That's what, that's a, uh, that's what He is. God, we're even 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 visualizing the words yud k vav k, uh, and, you know, and if you're looking at the sky as if that's the image of God is wrong, and I know there have been some chachamim that have said, yeah, but maybe you could picture an old man. I don't know what those chachamim meant, uh, but I surely know that they didn't mean to visualize like an actual person, like as if God has an image. It's in essence what they're trying to tell you. From my understanding is that if it's going to help you to pray better or to to have more hope when you're down that Hashem is this old man that loves you and so on that for that moment to 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 just not lose your mind or be suicidal know that Hashem in the back of your mind is like your your old man your old father but not to constantly think of Hashem as some guy walking around in the sky no that's that's Christianity that's idolatry uh, that's you know a sin. He has no body, has no likeness of a body. And even if you're going to say, yeah, but what about the time in the Gemara Masechet Brachot, where you have the Kohen, the Kohen Gadol comes and he says to us that I gave a Kadosh Baruch a blessing. Gemara says it, that a Kadosh Baruch said to, to, to the Kohen Gadol, give me a blessing. And now Chachamim explained, no, 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 from what we understand, it's not really Hashem that asks for a blessing, it's the Malach of Hashem, there's an angel of God. It's not God himself, it's the angel of God asked for a blessing. The point being is, there are certain things that are impossible for us to understand. Impossible for us to understand, because the way that they're explained and they're written in the Torah, the only way we can understand them is by visualizing something. Uh, 
Like, for example, it says that uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu had a, uh, there's a verse in the Torah, there's a verse in the Torah that HaKadosh Baruch Hu had a stone under his feet. What feet? What stone? And uh, Am Yisrael was, saw the stone. What stone? What are you talking about? We don't know. We don't know. It's prophecy. It's prophecy. Also says that Hashem opened the seven heavens. When we were at the uh, the uh, at Mount Sinai, he opened the seven heavens and showed Am Yisrael that there's nothing else but him. Meaning he showed him all of the mechanics of the world. Higher prophecy than even Ezekiel saw. He showed him behind the scenes. Meaning behind the sun, behind everything. He opened the seven heavens and showed him, look, there's nothing else but me. So can you understand what that means? No, I mean, we could, you know, visualize certain things based on our imagination and how many movies we watched. But in reality, we have no idea what that means. So there are certain things that are illustrated in the Torah that uh, is impossible, to, impossible for us to understand without visualizing something. Therefore, you should not spend time on that Torah. Spend it on Torah that you can understand and can uh, uh, fulfill without going into La La Land. Uh, why? Because that La La Land can get you into a lot of trouble. But good question. Uh, Ariel Yehudayev is saying, Hashem is infinite and has no body. Thank you, Ariel. It's impossible to understand that. Oh, okay, so you already gave them the uh, answer. Thanks. i going to save myself 10 minutes. Um, Tatiana Chazaku Baruch, thank you very much. Thank you, Tatiana, for the question and all your help and your Zikuel Abim that you and your husband do. Chaz, will Goim be expected to keep the whole Torah in the times of Mashiach? As Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 16 says, It shall be if they learn well the ways of my people to swear in my name as Hashem lives, just as they taught my people to swear by the Baal. Then they shall be restored along with my people. So, I mean, the prophet says that the, uh, every Jew that wears a tzitzit will have ten Gentiles from the 70 nations that were obviously righteous Noahites uh, come to him and uh, say, uh, you know, we were, our, our, for, our fathers lied to us. I mean, the Gentiles saying that their fathers, the Christians, the Arabs, the Buddhist, the mother, you know, whoever, lied to us, and your Torah is a man, please teach us Torah. So every Jew that has a tzitzit will have 2,800 Noahites to teach Torah. 2,800 Noahites to teach Torah, and at that point, they'll follow the entire Torah. Sure, they'll follow the entire Torah. Now, they're not going to become Jews, but they're going to follow the entire Torah from, from, from that perspective. You can't just, you can't become a Jew after the Mashiach comes. But they'll keep the entire Torah that's permissible for them to do, and uh, 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 which is surely going to be more than what we have uh, uh, now. More understanding, more clarity, what's expected of them. But nonetheless, they, uh, the righteous Noahides will, uh, will be expected to, to uh, fulfill an enormous part of Torah, and they'll have righteous Jews teach them. Interesting questions. Yes, you're right. Nikolai, okay, if we have a suspicion the Germans are from Amalek, from the Gaon from Vienna, and we're not allowed to benefit from anything Amalek created, how are we allowed to use any German-made products, cars, machines, especially if those founders were close associates of Hitler? Uh, so, I mean, first off, it's not necessarily we're not allowed to benefit anything from Amalek. We're not allowed to benefit anything from idol worship. If it's idol worship, but it's not just idol worship, it's a part of the idol worship. Meaning, if let's say an idol worshiper makes a shirt or makes a tie or, 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 or makes a software program, you're allowed to buy it, you're allowed to sell it, you're allowed to do whatever you want with it. But if whatever he made was part of his idolatry, meaning he took that uh let's say you know women take their hair and they give it to their false god you're not allowed to buy 
uh, that uh, that hair or whatever it is that they brought to their god because what they what they produced here is part of their idolatry it's the actual sacrifice itself in this case uh, so if an idol worshiper produces something but it's not part of their idolatry you're allowed to benefit from it but if it's a uh, part of their idolatry not allowed to benefit from it Amalek on the other hand it's not the same thing but either way uh, even if you were to say that the uh, some Chachamim would say that you shouldn't even benefit from anything that Amalek did because in essence everything that they did was wrong connected to idolatry and so on and so forth why would we be allowed to use cars and machines and so on that are made in German because there's a Sfek Sfeka there's double Sfek here double Sfek number one Sfek is whether the Nazis were really Amalek we're not 100 percent sure and even if we're saying that there is going to be nazis were amalek it doesn't necessarily mean all of them were amalek some yes some no how do we know there were even some jews that were nazis so are you gonna say there they were amalek also maybe but not necessarily amalek point being is it gets complicated second thing is is that even if the nazis are amalek uh you know who's to say that this german company had only german employees you could have some korean guy or some uh british guy or some jewish guy working that made this car or this machine so here you have already a bunch of different suffix the doubts that give you the permission to use the products themselves should you use the products is a different story it's a different story but i could tell you for sure that uh, if you're not going to use certain products because of anti-semitism and the like you're going to have a lot of problems just like if people wouldn't use certain products because they hate jews you're going to have a lot of problems and the reason why is because in today's world there is virtually no step that you can walk there's no product that you can benefit from there's no f nothing that you could do without that product having a few continents touch it a few continents touch it so you could say no no this thing is made in usa yeah the product is finished in the usa but some of the parts come from japan some of the parts come from india some of the employees come from israel some of the employees come from london you know by the time you're finished your average little toy or your computer or your software program or everything you may have touched seven continents you may have touched you know two three four five a hundred different religions uh and cults and so on so the point is, is that you got to use things based on clarity if this is something that was you know uh used by uh idol worshipers as part of their idolatry such as let's say for example wigs not allowed not going to add them to my life throw it out of my house done but if it's something that just says it's I don't know, made in uh, you know in, in zimbabwe or something you can't assume that this is anything made in uh, made by uh you know hitler hitler's dead already who knows that uh, if it's the same you know. meaning you have to you have to know should i still use it maybe not but the point is not that it's forbidden you can't just call anything forbidden you have to uh make more of a judgment call rather than just calling things forbidden next thank you for a very interesting answer to converting uh for converting a baby i didn't know i thought they had to be 13 or 12 for a girl and want yes so a baby that is uh we had a bohash of the merit to bring a couple of children to the bed dean of students of mine that converted and uh when the uh the mother uh brought the child uh, to the bed dean uh, the child wasn't 13 14 it was i don't know yeah, it was a few cases it was very small so the you know the kid dipped in the mikveh with the mom um and then later on when uh, the the child turns when it's a girl she turns 12 or the boy turns 13 they have to go back to the bed dean uh and uh confirm that the boy wants to stay a jew and the girl wants to stay a jew or at the very least confirm in front of a few kosher jews that they want to stay a jew but nonetheless they already are a uh, uh do the process of conversion when they're born or whenever when they're when they're little they just confirm it later on confirm it later on uh which is surely if they uh went to uh jewish school 
Or is that anointed? Um, uh, if they went to yeshiva, if, she, if they went to a seminary, then, uh, you know, confirming that their Judaism is going to be a piece of cake. If they don't want to be Jewish, uh, that means that there was something wrong with their upbringing. Uh, something wrong with their upbringing. Parashat uh, Vayera, chapter 21. Huh? Oh, thank you for the books. Oh, yeah, you're welcome, Benny. Parashat Vayera, chapter 21, 14. So Avram awoke early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave them to Hagal. He placed them on our shoulder along with the boy and sent her off. The next verse says, she cast off the boy beneath one of the trees. My question is, Ishmael is 15 or 16 years old. How can a guard carry on a shoulder such a young boy? Um, where is it? Uh, let's see. What's happened twice? Why, what makes you think that he's 15, though? Uh, oh, yeah, because he, you're saying because Tzak is already born, so he's 15. What's done to me? He uh, he got sick, or he lost his a uh, uh, he lost his strength. But I'm trying to find something uh, source for that. Let's say ah, okay, there you go. So the um, uh, says we drank copiously. Yeah, so there you go. Okay, so Rashi Rashi says it. Okay, so well, Hashem. All right, so. Um, Rashi says that uh, that Ishmael got sick, got sick, um, and therefore she had to carry him. Now uh, you also see that uh, the, the whole thing happens where uh, 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 Hagal gets a. Uh, you didn't ask this, but I'll just add this anyway. Hagal uh, uh, suddenly finds water, and that's the salvation. Uh, so how come, you know, it says that the, the, the well was always there the whole time. The well was there the whole time. So how come a, uh, she didn't see it? And uh, the Midrash uh, Rabbah says in Parashat Vayera is that uh, initially um, the water that Avram gave her had blessing in it and uh, was supposed to last her forever, pretty much as long as she needed but then Hagar started worshipping idols again like she did in the past and suddenly they ran out of water and then Ishmael got sick. Uh, but as far as the reason why she was, and that's why she wasn't able to see the well either. But as soon as she did tshuva, then suddenly she was able to see what was right in front of her the whole time. That's a good question. Next, as you guys can see, I'm not skipping any questions. I'm trying to read everything. Uh, we're already, wow, we're already at two hours. Okay, well, I'll try to do a couple more questions. Did Abraham inherit his father? What does it mean? His father's money came from Abu Dazara, but also why did his father merit to have a son like him? Ah, so, no, I mean, Abraham had much more money than his father. Abraham, uh, it says that Abraham uh, was blessed bakol. He was blessed with everything. Uh, from Hashem, Avraham was a multi-millionaire, so he didn't need any inheritance from his father. Um, so, no. And uh, his father, by the way, you should know, did tshuva. Terach did tshuva, and he completed his tshuva uh, by the reincarnation of Job. He came back as Job, uh, which the Midrash Rabbah also says that Job 
uh, there's a machloket of different time frames of when he lived, whether he lived at the time of Moshe Rabbeinu or he lived at the time of Avraham. And at the time of uh, Avraham, the Midrash says that his name was Utz. Was Utz, and he was married to uh, he was married to Dina. Uh, but um, but uh, the point is is that it's a uh, uh, it's a machloket of if he was Job or if Utz was Job or not. Either way, Terach was Job. Terach was Job. Job was Terach. That was Avram's father. Next, how are we supposed to understand the tefillin of Hashem on Bachot 6a? I explained it before. There are certain things we can't explain. There are certain things we can't explain. What does it mean that Hashem has tefillin? What does it mean that you could see a stone under the verse in the Torah that Am Yisrael saw the stone under the feet of Hashem? Hashem has no feet. What are they talking about? There are certain things that we cannot understand. Now, is there commentary on it in the Midrash, by the Chachamim, and that? Sure, there's a <whistles> lots and lots of writing on it. Is anything 100% this is Alakha? No. No. There's different opinions of what this is. Since it's not Alakha, you don't have to uh, 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 delve into it and uh, go into it. And I personally recommend you don't spend too much time trying to understand it because, like I said, this is a uh, impossible for a human to understand. And if it was possible for you to understand, it would only be if you were an extremely high level of Kedusha, Tara, Yirat Shemayim, a lot of Torah. You know, you, like, you know, somebody that's a Gedola Do, like a, uh, uh, Rav Sternbach or Rav Kanievsky or, or you know, one of these Dolin that's still alive with us, Baruch Hashem, today, maybe they could have a better understanding to some extent of what those things mean. But a uh, little uh, nothing like me, I don't know what that means. And, uh, you know, again, you may be a thousand times bigger than me as far as Torah and Mitzvot and everything else, but are you F. Kanievsky? I don't think so. If you are, please tell me because I can, I can publicize to the world that Rav Kanievsky watches my shurim, may increase the views. Uh, who was Rav Yosef's, Rav Yosef Karo's father? Rabbi Yosef Karo's father? That's what you're asking? That's a Wikipedia question. Why, why do I, uh, why do I have to, uh, be Wikipedia? Yeah, I'm gonna give you a answer by giving you a link to Wikipedia. There you go. Uh, let's see. Mm. Let's go back to the place where I was. Why do some people suffer so much in this world while others have it all? Is it because some are more worthy than others? This is a big question that even Moshe Rabbeinu asked. Even Moshe Rabbeinu asked, why do the righteous look like they're losing, they're suffering, and, and the, the wicked look like they're winning sometimes? Not always, because there are some righteous that look like they're Hashem have a fantastic life and there are some wicked that have a terrible life but that's understandable what's not understandable is why is there sometimes that a righteous person have a uh, uh, terrible life and a wicked person uh, has a uh, seems like a good life one of the places you can see is that for example the uh, learn with my Rav about the Malbim the Malbim was one of the Gdoleado that uh, some believed that he was going to be the next Gaumi Vilna. But he 
gave up, gave up his time and his life and his everything uh, and even his ability to become the uh, Gaul Mivilna um, for the sake of defending Am Yisrael against the Rashaim, the Reform, the heretics. And they tortured him uh, from city to city to city to city to the point where they literally almost killed him several times. They told the uh, the non-Jewish kings that he was uh, really a spy for the Germans uh, against the uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the country. Was a lot of crazy, and these are all Jews that were going against him. Long story short, he lived a bitter, miserable life. But if you read his books, you see like how is this person even able to think and write such holiness and beauty, despite being tortured and and and, and almost suffering every minute of his life. Oh, so Chamim explained in a in a uh, midrash also that um, Avraham Avinu was scared after the test, after the test of seeing the Akedat Yitzchak, and uh, then coming back from Akedat Yitzchak, seeing that his wife Sarai Menu died, and uh, Avraham passed the test with flying colors, but he was scared about the next test. He was scared about the next test. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu at that point told him not to worry. No more tests for you. You're done. Ten tests you got, you're done. And the reason why is because somebody else was born. Somebody else was born by name of Utz. And he is going to take over the tests. He's going to take over the suffering of the world. And the Midrash Rabbah says that this Utz was Job. Um, now... Uh, Question is why does uh, why does somebody have to have this suffering? Apparently, there has to be a balance. This against this. A kadosh baruch Hu created a certain balance that has to be in the world. Just like there is pressure, just like there is gravity, just like there is good, there is bad, there is light, there is darkness, there is joy, there is suffering. Uh, the point is that there is a balance in the world that, uh, in essence, Hashem maintains. And there is a certain bulk of suffering that each and every single person has. But rather, there are some people that have what appears to be a much larger part of that bulk. Uh, especially certain righteous people that have a special, a larger part of that bulk. And the Gemara Masechah B'chot says that sometimes HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives those righteous people more of that bulk of suffering. Uh, number one, because they can handle it. Number two, because he wants to reward them higher. Uh, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's obviously the uh, torture while they're suffering, but they'll, uh, they'll thank him for it when they get rewarded for it. But also because they can handle it. They can handle it. They're the people that get the higher suffering can handle the higher suffering. Um, so, point being is that there is a uh, a number of reasons, and it's not necessarily that a person is more worthy. It's that, uh, that it's it's a the tool fits more. You know, it's a uh, if you have you know this uh, cup over here, okay, and then you have this bottle. Okay, so it, the fact that I could fit more water in this bottle than this cup does not make this bottle more worthy? Not necessarily. It's just that this tool could fit more than this tool. Simple. Uh, so, but why does Hashem... There are sometimes you're going to see a tool where you see I'm almost done with the water. But there, and then you're going to see that there could be a, a full bottle of water. So sometimes you're going to see that there is a tool that uh, Hashem is, is able to handle more suffering, but Hashem doesn't give it more suffering because it's, it can't handle it. It's not being utilized the right way. So therefore, although it was capable of doing it, it's being misused and therefore Hashem doesn't use it. In other cases, Hashem uses it because He can't handle it. The point is that there is a certain balance in the world of suffering, certain balance of the world of, of good, certain balance of the world of everything. Everything is done with precision from Hashem. But there's also certain people that are vessels for certain things. I mean, it's very clear that there's certain people that Hashem uses as vessels to bring certain messages to the people throughout the different generations. We have prophets. 
So although there were many false prophets, you know, a, uh, that gave messages, but all their prophecies were false, you know, then there's the real prophets, but there were very, you know, there were fewer. Why? Because Hashem says it's not for everybody. Not for everybody. Yeah, but they all have technically the same tools. They all have eyes, ears, nose, mouth. Why can't you just use all of them? Because this one, I'm going to use the prophet, this one not. Why? Because this one fits all the descriptions that I needed to be a prophet. And that's it. So it's a, uh, uh, it's, it's not necessarily that every one of them was uh, good also. Because, you know, uh, Bilam was a prophet, but he was wicked. He was wicked. So it's not necessarily just because they were worthy as far as righteousness. Therefore, they were prophets. Sometimes they were wicked ones. But nonetheless, uh, it's all different vessels that Hashem uses. Let's see. What if you buy clothing from an online store and you find that the tag on the inside says Jesus the Savior? Should you get rid of it or just cut the tag off? The website didn't mention that it's a Christian store, just modest clothing. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could technically just cut the uh, the tag as long as it doesn't say Jesus anywhere else or anything like that. You could technically cut the tag uh, if it's modest clothing. Yeah, I don't believe that they, uh, it's part of their uh, idol worship to make clothes. So I think it's just they perhaps are missionizing through their clothes, but not actual idolatry. So you can keep the shirt or whatever the clothes is. Uh, Isaac, uh, thank you, Rabbi, for the shield. What is the most important thing to be prepared for when Mashiach comes? Tshuva. Every single day do tshuva, especially work on character traits. Especially character traits. Chaz, is Baal worship synonymous with Son of God worship and Tanakh? Uh, I recently read that the Canaanites taught that Baal was the son of El, the Jews, and taught that the son of Dagon in their own circles. Is this what Jeremiah means by how can you say I have not become contaminated, I have not gone after Baalim, meaning contaminate to Christians, Romans, and son of worship. Is uh, so. Bottom line is, you're asking is that is, is Baal worship synonymous with Son of God? Uh, no, because the uh, Baal worship really was. They believed that Baal was the actual God uh, to them. So, but Son of God is also another form of idolatry. So, Zeneve Lab is they're, they're they're both idolatry, but I wouldn't necessarily call them synonymous, though. I would call it synonymous. How can one get into prayer? It feels like nothing works and keep on praying and praying feels like talking to a wall, sadly. There's a shiur that I made in the Get It Ramban series uh, about prayer and uh, I recommend to, uh, to, uh, to, to watch it. Uh, also, there are certain books. There are certain books about prayer. There is a book by Arav Pinkus. Arav Pinkus writes a uh, book. I think it's over here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Gates of Prayer. Gates of Prayer by Feldheim Publishers. This is a book about prayer. There's many other books by Arav Pinkus about prayer, there's a, Baruch uh, Hashem, many, many books about prayer. Rabbi Vigdor Miller writes about prayer. Uh, really, any Musar book, any Musar book that you read, if you start delving over the words and really think about what are they saying? What, what do you, why is it death penalty for this? Why is it punishment for this? Why is this an abomination? Why is this disgusting? You start thinking about what you're reading and not just read it like a machine. It's going to help you in your day-to-day -day life, including in your prayer. Uh, so, and it also obviously helps if you understand what you're saying in the prayer. Anthony Lopez. Hi, Rabbi. Is there a special significance with ya Jacob's last 
with Joseph before he was sold. Commentary. Ah, okay. Uh, so, yes, there is. There is a... Um, later on, when, uh, when uh, Yosef, Yosef sends the brothers back to uh, tell his father Yaakov that he's still alive, the uh, the brothers carefully bring the message uh, through uh, first a uh, nice uh, plan of having Serach, the daughter of Asher, sing in the background to calm Yaakov Avinu uh, and also hear the uh, message subconsciously through her song. But nonetheless, initially it says that Yaakov didn't believe them until the brothers, the tribes told him that there is the Agalot, there's the uh, the, um, uh, the 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 uh, carriages outside that ya- that Yosef sent them with. The agalot is so so. Chachamim say what, what so? First of all, are the uh, tribes not tzaddikim? Why did you not believe them? Why would they lie about it? Why they just want to torture their father? And number two, why does he only believe him after he sees a bunch of cows? What's the uh, carrot? So what's the uh, what's the pshat here? So they say that the last lesson, it was hard for Yaakov Avinu to believe that uh, Yosef was alive. Not that he was; it was hard for him to believe that he was alive physically. It was hard for him to believe that Yosef was alive, meaning righteous, and the viceroy of Egypt. Meaning, how could he still be righteous? Because alive physically is meaningless. Alive to the to, to tzaddiki means alive means he's a tzaddik. How could he be a tzaddik and a viceroy of Egypt? How could it be? It's a coxymore. How could you be a uh, leader of the uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 goyim over there with all the money in the world and at the same time be righteous? How? So he said, look, he sent us the agalot, sent us the, the 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 carriages over here with the cows. So what's the what's the thing? So this Yaakov understood is to show is to, is a message from Yosef to show him hey Abba I still remember the last shiul that you taught me which is the laws of the uh, Igla Ufa and the uh, the uh, which what happens when uh, the red cow also the Igla Ufa which is if you cut a uh, Igla when there's an issue of murder and so on Things that are relevant to that particular subject, I still remember the whole shoe. After twenty years, so at that moment it says that Yaakov Avinu was uh, happy and believed that uh, that uh, Yosef is alive, meaning righteous, despite being a viceroy of Egypt. Because in order for him to remember all the details from twenty-one years ago, that means that he would have had to continue thinking about it and learning it over the years. And if he's learning over the years, then surely he's righteous. Next guy, last Torah topic, Igla Rufa. Yeah, yeah, just, I just said everything. Uh, so you know the answer. So why are you asking? Uh, I often get woken up in the middle of the night and have a person that I have never met in mind and get my sephel of psalms and read and pray. Is this normal? It happened from time to time in my teens, off and on in my 20s and 30s, but it's more frequent in my 40s. Is this normal? No, it's not normal. Uh, what should I do when it happens? I do not know the man other than he appears to be Jewish. i never seen him before or where he's from. Just feel like our prayers and mitzvot save lives. Yeah, you're right. If you have these thoughts about somebody, it could be somebody that's related to you from a previous life or uh, something like that, and uh, they're asking you for prayers. You should pray for them. You should learn for them. You should give tzedakah for their sake and you know do all types of mitzvot for their sake. Sure, they're coming to you for a reason, but it's not normal. But it happens. Yeah, you're not alone. Okay, I think we're at the last question. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, last one. What a wonderful blessing to have you in our lives. Oh, wonderful blessing to have you guys. Okay, I think uh, 
I think we got all the questions. Okay, okay, Rabotai, thank you again for uh, learning with me. The school of mitzvot Rabot. I uh, surely enjoyed it. Hopefully, you did too. Bezot Hashem will be in touch next week. Again, I don't know if we're going to be in the same schedule or not. Uh, you know, questions and answers doing like this is, uh, as you can see, you interact, you are in essence making the shield. To have uh, just a lecture for uh, two hours, two and a half hours straight with just me talking, um, you know, I can do it. It's just, uh, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. So, we'll, just, we'll uh, keep you posted. Surely there's still going to be new videos published every day and new learning and so on. We're not, uh, we're not retiring or anything. But uh, this finding a place is taking up a lot of time and energy and also the uh, a lot of projects that we're going on. So uh, I'm not sure if we're going to keep the same schedule, but uh, we'll uh, keep you posted. Thank you again for learning with me. Have a uh, wonderful uh, week, rest of the week, and Shabbat Shalom, Chodesh Tov. This is the Chodesh, this is the month of miracles, Kislev. And Bezat Hashem, Ta'asu, V'Tetzlichu. Uh, and uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu bless each and every single one of you, your families, with a uh, long life full of Torah, mitzvot, gemut chasadim, and complete tshuva. To us, to you, to everybody that supports us, Baruch Hashem, and everyone supports you. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen v'amen. Baruch Hashem, we've completed another year at Bezat Hashem. Rabbi Ephraim and I are very proud to announce some major milestones that we've achieved. Bezat Hashem. And with your help, our dear partners, over 60 million minutes of our Torah has been watched over the last year. That's a million hours of Torah to help people do tshuva and get closer to Hashem. Over 300,000 CDs have been distributed around the world for free. We've also made over a thousand lectures between the two of us, as well as also with Rav Chaim being added to the roster. Over 60,000 regular viewers are watching our Torah right now across the board. Over 200,000 answers regarding Alacha, family, Shlom Bayit, different topics on a regular basis being uh, given to people. Over 10,000 people have been helped, whether it's through food or different uh, financial issues. A thousand families of Torah scholars are being helped by Irgun Bezad Hashem. We've published and distributed over 5,000 Alachic books, kuntresses, uh, newsletters, Musar books around the world. We are also currently helping over 130 families complete their conversion to Orthodox Judaism. Our TV channel continues to grow, our YouTube channel, our Facebook pages, our WhatsApp pages, everything continues to grow, Baruch Hashem. Thanks to Hashem and thanks to our dear partners. Be'ezat Hashem, much more next year. B'Shem Hashem Nasev and Atzliach, we're very excited to offer you the new Be'ezat Hashem app 3.0. It's a newer, faster app, full of Torah, lots of Kedusha, by uh, the shiurim that we do, myself, Rabbi Ephraim, Rabbi Chaim, uh, where you'll have uh, also newer features where you're able to use the app uh, while you're using other applications on your phone. You'll be able to share the, uh, the lectures directly from the app. You'll be able to donate online and support our cube and our Torah work that we're doing. And the most exciting feature is that you'll be able to actually ask questions directly on the app and get answers from the rabbis directly from the app. This is something unprecedented, and Bo Hashem will be able to offer it. Thank you again for all of your support. Check it out. Make sure you have the kosher Torah that uh, will re-energize your neshama each and every single day. Call to B'chavat